the Upper Room. So glad you've joined us. If you haven't been with us for several lessons, let me catch you up. We're in a series we're calling The Expression. And that is that Jesus is the exact representation of God. I love how Peterson in the message puts it in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. And that is that the Son perfectly mirrors God. And so that's what we're studying in the book of John. How Jesus explains the Father to us. We can actually know the Father. Because as you know by now, John 17, 3 says that eternal life is in knowing the Father and the Son. So this is such a fun series that we've been doing together. And uh, we're going to continue on through the book of John. We'll be in chapter 3 if you'll turn there now. Let's jump right into a discussion question. How would you describe attitude? How would you describe it? What is attitude? Have a great discussion. It's hardly a debate that two-year-olds and teenagers have attitude. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, we could have that discussion question and you could just fill the time with examples if you want. Uh, our one and a half year old granddaughter, who by the way, you know, make no mistake about it, is the most beautiful and intelligent little girl in the world, but already she's ahead of her time. She's not even two and she has some attitude, as her mom would say, some sassiness about her. I think it was last week, she was gonna take a cup of something into the living room and I said, hey, Lindsay, let's keep that in the kitchen. And she kept walking and said, no, 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 no. <laughs> so two-year-olds have attitude. Teenagers, as you know, usually have attitudes, but it's not just two-year-olds and teenagers that have attitudes, teams have attitudes, and that plays a major role for most teens. Let me quote to you from an article of the American Psychological Association when they say this, sometimes teams seem to click without too much effort, working together seamlessly and producing great work as a result. Other collaborations crash and burn. It's the deep level factors you can't see at a glance. Those deep level factors shape what researchers call the ABCs of teamwork, and that is attitudes, behaviors, and cognitive states that collectively influence whether a team achieves its goals. Okay, so attitude plays a major role for teams, not just for two-year-olds and teenagers. Uh, attitude plays a role in every person's life. We'll talk about that. And attitude, believe it or not, plays a major role with airplanes. And that brings us to our location. We are out in front of the Grand Junction Regional Airport, and it is at this location that you'll see two military airplanes that they have propped up so that you can see them as you drive into the airport, which made me think about my friend John Verdon. John, uh, we've known for years and years, was actually, and you'll see one of those is a Blue Angel airplane. He was a Blue Angel pilot years ago. And so when I thought about airplanes and what I've heard about airplanes, I'm not a pilot myself, you know, I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, but I'm not a pilot. But <laughs> what I've heard is they have attitude. They really have attitude. I think I mentioned it in our last lesson that comes back again today. And I thought of all the people I know, John would be the perfect guy to explain attitude of an airplane because I, I really hadn't gotten the concept of it. And so I asked him and he emailed me back uh, an answer to my question. And I'm going to read his answer verbatim. He would know, right? And so here's his answer to what attitude means when it comes to airplanes. So John wrote me this, the attitude of an airplane is where you are in relation to the earth. Am I climbing, diving, turning straight and level? There could be a million situations depending on your idea of where you actually are versus where you think you are. If your attitude matches your understanding of where you think you are, life is good. If your attitude is different than where you think you are, it could be dire. I think I'm straight and level at night in the clouds and I'm really in a spiral downward left turn. It happens. Probably how JFK Jr. died. We mentioned that in the last lesson. 
People think they are smarter than the instruments. A lot of those people die. So I guess the question is, is my life's path where I think it is, or am I heading for an unexpected crash? As you can tell, attitude is really everything. And again, I'm so glad we could film here. If you would, for the next several minutes, be patient with the aircraft taking off and landing. I'll try to overcome that with some volume here, but I wanna go back to one phrase that John wrote. Here it is. People think they are smarter than the instruments. And with that attitude, about the attitude of their aircraft, it can be dire straits for them. And I believe, as he makes the analogy about our lives, that's a great analogy. Because so many of us refuse to live by the instruments and just go based on how we feel. And the truth is, the result is a crashed life. So what is the instrument that we're talking about in life? Well, of course, it has to be God's Word, right? Uh, Jesus provides us understanding of the Father. That's part of the instrument, but specifically God's Word. Now, I got to tell you, I know more people now who refuse to think biblically because they're so much more comfortable thinking based on how they feel and what feels right to them. And they do what feels right and they do what they want to do instead of flying by the instrument of God's Word. And that's why we insist in the upper room on keeping Jesus as the focal point, God's Word as the instruments by which we fly our lives. You've heard me many times talk uh, in disparaging terms about Christian celebrities and how often we look to Christian celebrities. Whether we're talking about pastors or people in the music industry of Christianity, uh, we look to them for answers. And I came across, ironically, this week, a quote from the lead singer of a group called Skillet. And I'm going to read it verbatim what he said about this idea. We must stop making worship leaders and thought leaders or influencers or cool people or relevant people the most influential people in Christianity. And yes, that includes people like myself. I've been saying for 20 years that we are in a dangerous place when the church is looking to 20-year-old worship singers as our source of truth. We now have a church culture that learns who God is from singing modern praise songs rather from the teachings of the Word. I appreciate his honesty, and there's probably many in his industry that don't appreciate how candid he is about this. Our inability or our unwillingness to use God's Word as the instrument by which we fly our lives is causing havoc amongst so many people who name the name of Christ. I have referred to the Babylon Bee several times. I go back to the Babylon Bee, that satirical website where they write things that, uh, you know, some people are offended by, but I tend to love them. They give me a smile every time I hear them. Supposedly this is from Vatican City. The Catholic Church announced this week Pope Francis has excommunicated the Apostle Paul over his outdated views on women, families, and social issues. We regret we placed this deeply misogynistic and homophobic man on a pedestal for 2,000 years, said Francis to reporters. Paul's continued defiance of modern Catholic sensibilities will no longer be allowed. At publishing time, the Pope had announced an additional inquiry against St. Peter on the Apostles' continued insistence that people repent of their sins. <laughs> See, it's really not cool to look to the Apostle Paul or Peter for words of wisdom about life inspired by the Holy Spirit. There's so much truth to that. Now, we're going to go to the dictionary to get the dictionary's definition of attitude and we'll refer back to it several times now because I think the dictionary is spot on with this. And here's what it says. Attitude, a settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something, typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. I love that. A settled way of thinking or feeling about something or a person and it shows up at how I live. We have settled some things in our mind or in how we feel, and that's our attitude. Discussion question number two then, we talked about you defining attitude. Now, specifically, how would you describe your attitude about life?
maybe the best description I've ever heard, and it's lengthy, it comes from Chuck Swindoll, and he writes this. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude, to me, is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think, say, or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way we cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. And that's why I talk to you about the instrument connected to the attitude of an airplane, we must develop our attitude based on the instrument of God's Word, not just how everybody else tells us to think or feel about life in general. Okay, so I ask you to turn to John 3, our text today, and let me give you a warning here. We're going to cover a lot of ground, and I'm not going to be able to go deeply into any one part of it. I just want to show you what's in there and then in your time together and in your personal time in the coming week I'm gonna ask you to really go deeply into some of the things we're gonna bring up to you today but again it is uh, there's a lot of text here there's a lot going on here so basically what we're gonna talk about for the next several minutes are the small things the silly things the submissive things and the sovereign things that should develop and establish our attitudes about life. Okay, let's begin with the small things. Do you believe that things are just too small to make any difference in your life? This past weekend, the Kansas City Chiefs were playing in an NFL game against the Buffalo Bills. And from the outrage that flowed out of that game, it seems as though it all came down to one play. And it was a crazy play, I won't go into, but Kansas City scored a touchdown and it put, would have put them ahead with a minute left. The penalty was thrown against a wide receiver who lined up offsides and the claim was, you, you never call that, why'd you call it this time? I gotta tell you, I played wide receiver in high school, I coached wide receivers when I was coaching football and there is one thing that you learn from the time you're in high school that you teach when you're teaching even high school students, high school football players, and I'm sure it's taught all the way through, and that is when you go to line up, you look out to the referee, to the line judge, and you can ask him, am I lined up correctly? And he will always tell you, he'll do that favor for you. In this case, the wide receiver's name was Kadarius Tony, and evidently he did not ask, and he did not know that he was off sides, okay? That's a little thing, and that's what the outrage was about. From the coach, from the quarterback, outraged that they would call something so small. So the question becomes, is there a time when something so small it shouldn't matter? And so we get to our text in John chapter 3, verse 22. Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went into the Judean countryside. Jesus spent some time with them there baptizing people. We actually get more detail later that it was actually his disciples baptizing people, but the point is baptisms were taking place. Verse 23, at this time, John the Baptist was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water there and people kept coming to him for baptism. I told you there might be some distractions. Those are military jets. This is so much fun. That's a garbage truck. This is so much fun. <laughs> and so what little thing do we find there? You know the little thing there is the two words, there was much water. No big deal, right? I'm not gonna do a history lesson with you, but at some point in Christianity over the last 2,000 years, <laughs> at some point in Christendom, in the last 2,000 years, it was decided we don't need much water. That's inconvenient. All we need is it's just a sprinkling. 
a smattering of water, and that will do for baptisms. Okay, it's a little thing. It's not a big deal. Uh, are we talking about eternal life here? Not according to scripture, but it is a thing that they needed much water for baptism. The question becomes why? And this argument has been going on for years and years and years. Is sprinkling enough or do you have to be immersed? What is that all about? At this point, you need to understand that the word baptism is a transliteration of Greek and it literally means to submerge or immerse. And it was usually used with the Greeks when they did their dishes, when they submerged them underwater. They didn't just sprinkle on a drop or two and go, it's clean. That had incredible imagery and we pick up that imagery and that's why this is a little thing that really is important. We pick it up in Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 3. What shall we say then? Are we to remain in sin so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? And again, many people say, well, that's just symbolic, but listen to the imagery here. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. We have been buried in and submerged underground is the idea. If you're looking at some imagery of what Jesus did for us, we have been baptized into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too we may live a new life. It is a picture, and you know that God is into pictures, the rainbow and all kinds of images. The parables Jesus taught were stories that were laid alongside ideas so that we can understand from a visual standpoint what the point was. Baptism is a visual image of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Just as Jesus, according to Paul, was crucified and was buried and rose from the dead, so we ought to do the parallel of that and in the image sense be buried die to ourselves be buried and raised to walk a new life it's a little thing right it's a little thing again am i saying your eternal life is in danger no i'm just saying that scripture means something and words mean something and we tend to say little things i don't need to pay attention to but little things become big things and if i'm willing to wash away the little things that I see in God's Word, I will be willing eventually to wash away the things that we consider a big deal. Back in 2014, Admiral William McRaven did the commencement address for the University of Texas because that's the institution from which he graduated. He went on to become a Navy SEAL and was a Navy SEAL for 36 years. And so he was doing the commencement address and you may have heard this, it's worth looking up. It's fascinating. And he basically gave them 10 ways you can change the world. All right, 10 things you can do that will change the world. Do you know what number one on his list of 10 things that you should do in your life to change the world was? I love this. Make your bed. That was number one to these University of Texas graduates. Make your bed. Now, if you know me well, and my wife Christy behind the camera there, doing such a fine job, knows me well, making the bed is a big deal to me. It's a big deal. It always has been. And I don't know why, but he explains it. He says, if you're not willing to do the small things, you'll never do the big things right. And I think that's the point is the small things that we read in scripture they're worth really understanding even though we consider them small things all right it's an attitude i guess that's my point with making the bed every day it's an attitude and that is let's start the day with something done well and go on with our day and if the rest of the day falls apart we can at least come home and go i did something well today i love the fact that he says this to these graduates we see examples in scripture how little things become big things. You don't have to look any further than 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6. Remember, God had told his people to not touch the Ark of the Covenant. Under no circumstances were they to touch the Ark of the Covenant. So we pick it up in verse 6. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the Ark of God because the oxen stumbled makes sense. This thing's really valuable. It's very precious. Oh, it's starting to tip. He reaches out to save the day. 
You may know what happens. Verse 7, the Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Last discussion question, what is your opinion about that event? Okay, you know what? Your opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> I know we live in a time when our opinions are what, what matters most. Your opinion doesn't matter. The reality is it's a little thing, but God said, don't touch the ark. And God said, you touched the ark. I, I told you not to. That's a, little things become big things. Okay, so we start with the attitude that we better pay attention to even the small things that God tells us and requires of us if we're to understand how to fly by the instrument, how to not crash and burn, as you saw that was a really crashed and burned. The second thing we notice in this passage in John 3 is not the little things, the small things, but it is the silly things. The silly things that we have to pay attention to. And again, silliness is a zero-sum game. What that means is silliness, in terms of what we're going to see here, is resulting in the fact that I hope you lose in this competition. I hope that I win, you lose, and it's all silliness in the kingdom of God. And I'll remind you once again about the definition of attitude. It is a settled way of thinking or feeling about something or someone that results in a resultant behavior, a settled way of thinking, okay? So what was the thinking going on in John chapter three, verse 25? A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people, and everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. Wah! Wah! Can you see it? Can you see the attitude, a way of thinking, a way of feeling about a certain person that results in a behavior? And this is what I'm calling silliness. It's silliness question, not a discussion question. Are you involved in any silliness right now? Based on that passage, I kind of boil silliness down to complaints, contention, and competition. Okay, let's start with the complaints. You probably understand, we've talked about it before, that the Israelites were complaining and grumbling. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is referring back to that 40-year span of time in the wilderness with the people of God, the Israelites, and he talks about how Jesus was there, present with them as the rock that gave them water. And now we pick it up in verse 5. God was not pleased with most of them, for they were cut down in the wilderness. Do I have to explain what that means? They crashed and burned. Those things happen as examples for us that we will not crave evil things as they did. So do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And let us not be immoral as some of them were, and 23,000 died in a single day. And let us not put Christ to the test as some of them did by grumbling and complaining. We find that in Numbers chapter 21. And they were destroyed by snakes. And do not complain as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages have come. We have this as an example for us. What is it? Grumbling and complaining is crashing and burning. That's what Paul is saying. All right. If you're grumbling and you're complaining about anything, you're not flying by the instrument that God has given you, and I'm not flying by that instrument. Look at the things they did. They craved evil things. They were idolaters. They were immoral. You see that in the phrase he used, they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Does that not describe our day? We are a people who sit down to drink and eat and get up and play, and that's what our whole life is about for many of us. He calls that idolatry and immorality. They grumbled and they complained. Okay, all that to say it's silliness. It's silliness to not use God's word as our instrument to teach us that complaining about anything really is not of him. And his people should be the very last people on the earth to ever complain about anything. Not just that, there is the constant contention with each other. 
And we see that again in verse 25, a debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew. If we're going to fly by the instruments that God has given us, debating one another, having contention with one another over things is a waste of time. And then finally, they were in competition. And you saw that when John's disciples were saying, everybody's going to him instead of us. Competition, I tell you what, competition is absolutely rampant in the modern church. And I can give you so many examples, I need not do that, but it's all silliness. Question, again, are you engaged in silliness? It's an attitude, it's a way of thinking, it's the way of feeling about people, about things, and it really dictates how we behave. So it's time we settle the small things, we settle the silliness, and third, that we settle submission. Simply put, submission for the follower of Jesus is success. You want a successful flight, you'll learn about submission. Again, what is attitude? It is simply the way we think or feel about something or someone that really bears itself out in how we behave. What does submission have to do with that? Verse 27, John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it to him from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. Famous verse here. Boy, you want to memorize a verse? Comes right from the lips of John the Baptist. Verse 30. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. Submission is a staple of following Jesus. James 4, 7, submit yourselves then to God. Ephesians 5, 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It is the word, as we've said before, hubitasso, which means to arrange your life under another, okay? It is a military term that was used in that day and age as the Roman government through military power literally took up residence in Palestine and reigned over them. They saw pictures of Hupatasso all the time, and now we see it in Scripture. To follow Christ is to arrange your life under His authority. Submission is everything. And those who claim to live for Christ, those who are part of the church, who have this prideful idea about living that says, I will do what I want to do when I want to do it, you understand one thing right away, and that is they don't get the submission thing. They don't have the attitude of submissiveness that is required to follow Jesus. So three things come to mind in terms of this idea of submission. Number one is I'm content. You see contentment in John the Baptist. When they say, uh, we're losing disciples, we're losing people, it's okay. Everything we have is from the Father above. He takes care of us. Are you content with what God has given you? There's contentment, there's cheerfulness. He says, I'm glad to be the friend of the bridegroom, the best man. I'm glad to support him. It thrills me to play that role. So there's contentment, there's cheerfulness, and finally, there's a calculation. And that's the kind of the mathematics behind it there in verse 30. He must become greater and greater. I must become less and less. I calculate this, and my whole life is about making sure Jesus has more attention than I do. And so we've talked about the attitudes present in this text, the attitudes of the small things mattering, and the attitude of silliness that we need to avoid, and now submission as just an absolute staple of following Jesus. Now we will end with the sovereignty issue. We'll pick it up in chapter 3, verse 31. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. He is sovereign. We are of the earth and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe. We'll come back to that. How few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gives him the spirit without limit. The Father loves his Son and has put everything into his hands, and anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. Settle it now. 
forever in our attitudes that God is sovereign. John calls him the greatest and that he deserves all of our affection, all of our attention, all of our talk and all of our time. He deserves it all. It's not that we add him to our great lives. Maybe he'll make them even better. No, he is all. He is greater than anyone and anything on this earth. Last night, Christy and I watched about a two-hour documentary on Reggie White. If you're a football fan, I know I'm doing a lot of football stuff, but hang in there. Uh, he, he is one of the greatest NFL football players of all time. He played basically in the late 80s and into the 90s. I think he retired in the year 2000, but they called him the Minister of Defense because he was also an ordained minister. He was radical about his Christianity, and it offended a lot of people. He didn't mind telling anyone anytime, whether there was politicians or the media, about Jesus and how Jesus doesn't tolerate a lot of the lifestyles going on. And so he became famous because of how good he was and because of how so many people didn't like what he stood for. All of his former teammates love him. They adored him. The coaches all adored him. He really has gone down as one of the greatest NFL defensive players of all time. Uh, he was, out of 15 years that he played, 13, he was an All-Pro. Okay, that tells you a little bit about him. Now, after he finally retired, after playing for the Eagles and then the Packers, and he finally retired in the year 2000, he poured himself in, like he poured himself into playing football, he poured himself into understanding God's Word at a deeper level. So much so that he went to Israel and he found a teacher who could teach him Hebrew so he could fully understand the Old Testament. And there are people, you know, who didn't like him who said, oh, he's left his Christianity, he's become a Jew. And he set the record straight by saying, no, I just want to know the Father in a real way, not secondhand by what I've been told. He said it was during this time after his retirement that he admitted that for most of his life he had been nothing more than a motivational speaker. And now he so wanted to be able to really explain the reality of who God was to people. And some people took that as, oh, so he's sorry for all the things he said. He didn't come out and say he was sorry for anything he said. He just said, I want people to know the Father, and so I must go to much deeper level to understand him and what he was basically saying. I didn't fully understand the sovereignty of God until I got into the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. And he saw that the story is not really about us and how God uses and blesses us. In fact, he, this one scene, he says this, he flashes his famous big grin, toothy smile, and he says, the Father doesn't need football. And that sounds obvious to you and to me, but there's so many things in our lives, I think, that we think God needs us to do this. Well, to say that, to assume that means, I don't really believe he's sovereign. He really doesn't need anything. He chooses to use us and to work through us, but he is sovereign. So again, what we got from that part of the text is that he is sovereign. There's no one like him. He deserves all our time, our talk, our attention, our affection. Secondly, there's a phrase in there I want to pull out. And John says that few really believe Jesus. And I want to hammer that home when it comes to our attitudes. And this is huge, really, in our life at this point. Few means few. That's what it means. We tend to think, well, it doesn't really mean that. He doesn't mean few. He means not everybody. No, he said few. Let me give an example. Matthew 7, 13 of the Sermon on the Mount. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few find it. In that text, John called Jesus truth. He is absolute truth. And that idea that there is absolute truth and that Jesus is that truth is absolutely unpopular, not just in the culture, even in the modern church today. There's a pretty famous author out there right now by the name of Mulad bin Zadi. And here's how he really <laughs> portrays this idea. He says, throughout our common history, the belief that there is only one way to heaven has only led us to division, war, and misery. He goes on, the absolute truth is the biggest myth in human history. He represents most people in our culture. There is no absolute truth. 
And if you claim that, you're causing problems. Uh, of course, we've said this so many times. <laughs> the the label for our ministry, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the truth. He was either a liar, he was crazy, or he was telling the truth, and that's what we have to decide. So many in the modern church won't acquiesce to that concept, even though it came from the lips of Jesus. And then the fourth thing I saw in that text is the unlimited spirit. What I think he means by that, that Jesus had the unlimited spirit, is not because the spirit who is the person of the spirit, the person of God who is the spirit, comes in portions. Like, I got a half and you got a quarter and, you know, this guy got an eighth of the spirit. No, the spirit comes in his entirety. I think what he says there is to have the full spirit is to have access to absolutely allow the Spirit in all His influence to guide us and teach us in life, to counsel us. Paul admonishes the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. You might remember that word is actually quench. You can actually put Him out in your life if you want. To have the full Spirit means He has full access to my life and I go completely by how He guides me. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit have total access to Him. Controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. In other words, to use my reasoning, my body as the instrument to fly my life will lead to crashing and burning. He goes on, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So, he was full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had total access and control over Jesus. And then finally, the phrase that comes out of that text that jumped out to me is, believing is obeying is eternal life. That word believing, again, is pistuo, and it means confidence. In the upper room, in John 14, we read it before, it says this, verse 23, Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and take up residence with him. The person who does not love me does not obey my words, and the word you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. In other words, you can say you love God all you want, but if you don't obey the words of Jesus, you don't love God. Believing is obeying is loving God and having life. First John chapter 2, John again goes back to this concept in verse 3, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey his commandments, that person's a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And then you take those words and the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, Jesus says, the wise man obeys me, lives out my commands. The foolish man may be a church attender, may call himself a Christian, but if he doesn't live out my words, doesn't obey me, his life will crash and burn. He does not live by the instruments I've given him. Obedience is a key part of living by those instruments. Let me take you back one more time to what my friend John said. People think they are smarter than the instruments. A lot of those people die. So I guess the question is, is my life's path where I think it is or am I heading for an unexpected crash? So many lives are crashing and there are people who say, I go to church, I claim the name of Christ, but they're not living by the instruments. They don't have the attitude in their life that is evident by the way they think and feel based on God's word and the Son of God. So from John's perspective and what he just wrote, I believe what he's saying is that settles it. That settles it. Settle it in your heart and mind from this point on that the small things are sometimes important. You better pay attention to them. The silly things need to be discarded from your life and are not important at all. Submission is all important in your following of Christ and living that out and his sovereignty 
is something that you cannot negotiate in your life. He is fully in charge and nobody else deserves your worship. Several years ago, Dave and Lynn Phillips felt like God was leading them to do something different than what they were doing. And they sensed that God was telling them to care for really the unknown in the world, the children who were starving to death and were being harmed around the world. And yet when he was told, well, you'll have to start your own corporation to do that, he didn't want to do that because he said, that would mean I'd have to get up in front of people and talk and I don't want to do that. That's not my thing. Well, you see, that was how he felt at the time. That's what he thought at the time. Fortunately, in 1992, they stepped forward with what they believed the Spirit of God was calling them to do. They started a corporation called CHF, Children's Hunger Foundation. And six weeks after they started this corporation out of their garage, he received a phone call from somebody in Honduras who said, I've heard you've started this organization. I gotta tell you, I have seven children who are dying of cancer and they need this drug. It was a certain drug that only two places in America actually made. He said, I need that, can you get that? And he wrote down the name of the drug and he prayed with the guy and he said, I'll do my best. He literally hung up the phone and as he hung up the phone and had his hand still on the receiver, it rang. He picked it up and it was somebody calling him saying, we heard of what you're doing and we have $8 million worth of this drug. It was the same drug that we want to give to you. Literally 48,600 vials of this cancer healing drug. He says, we want to give it to you and we'll send it wherever you want to send it. He said, I have a place to send it. They agreed before the week was out to send it to Honduras and several other places. And that was the beginning of CHF. Now, all these years later, you can look it up. Forbes magazine, Forbes.com, says that their organization is amongst the most trustworthy charitable organizations in our entire country. In the time since that phone call, they have sent out $950 million worth of food to over 10 million children around the world. In addition, they've sent out 110 million toys to children, and it's all done locally through the local church. And so the people there know what the needs are on the ground. I listen to that story, and I think my first reaction is one of silliness. God, why can't I be a part of something like that? Why don't you do things like that through us? And then I realized that is silliness. They fully have come to the conviction, the attitude that God is sovereign and he can be trusted and they will live in obedience even though their flesh instruments say, I don't want to do that. I'm uncomfortable with that. I just think that story, the CHF story, is such a great story that exemplifies the text we just went through. I know we flew through it. I know much more can be mined out of that text. And I'm hoping that you as a group will sit down and talk diligently and work through, mine what's in there, because it's remarkable. So much of our lives is about the silliness that goes on. And we ignore some of the small things that are important. And submission is something we don't feel comfortable with, so we don't do it. And the sovereignty of God is something we kind of ignore because we're in charge of our own lives. And I'm telling you that these are all attitudes. We must settle in our hearts and minds, the way we think and the way we feel, that sometimes the small things matter eating together as a community, celebrating one another, knowing each other, those seem to be small things, they become huge things. We need to ignore the silly things that the modern church is so preoccupied with. We need to learn and be accountable for submitting our lives to the sovereign God and submitting to one another. That's not very popular, is it? That's what I believe this is about. You and I do not have time to continue with the attitudes that primarily we have that are uh, resembling the attitudes of the culture and most in the modern church. He has called us, and you see it in this text, he has called us to a different attitude. 
a different relation to real life, not what we think our life is about, but to real life. It's time that we who follow Christ no longer are experiencing the crashing and the burning because it was just something we said we did, not what we really did. Our real attitude needed a check. Settle it now forever. Thanks for joining us. It's been fun. We've had some military jets taken off, some big jets taken off. I tell you what though, my friend John is absolutely right. If we refuse to live by the instruments, the Word of God, the person of Jesus Christ, crashing and burning is all we should expect. We love you. Thanks for joining us on this journey.